Thanks for coming out. Uh, you know, we've been accused of being a, a, a big commercial firm, but there's one thing we can organize is shit weather on a night like this. <laughs> For those of you that are squeamish, um, I don't smoke, I don't drink, but I swear a hell of a lot. So if you're not, gonna, if you're not up to that, please leave now. <laughs> right. So why am I an architect? Uh, I think many of us ask this question as to why we go into this profession. And there's probably students over here that have had an all-nighter thinking, why the hell did we go into this uh, profession? Um, and uh, Matthew, one of my guys, he's just had an all-nighter. Thanks for coming, Matthew. Good job there. Um, I yeah, sometimes I wonder, but these are the reasons why I became an architect. Lego. I don't know, hands up how many people got influenced by Lego. Yes, more than, a, more than one. In truth, that's not Lego, that's actually Montini. So that was a cheap ripoff in the early 60s of Lego. It fitted onto Lego, and this is what Granny Oma Aleda from Holland sent me as a little chokurki. Uh, these, these, this is what I wanted. What do I want for Christmas? What do I want for my birthday? This stuff. And after a couple of years, Oma said, not sending you blocks anymore. So I ran to mommy and complained, and she said, well, you're going to have to do drawings of the buildings that you've built because you can't keep them under your bed anymore. You now need to demolish them and make new ones, so make a drawing. So those are my amazing parents. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so, first day, grade one, this is my sketch. So I've been drawing building stuff since a very early age. I think this is why one eventually kind of picks a career. The people that have influenced um, my education, uh, apart from Mr. Rodemey in Standard 3, who was the maths and chess teacher, who eventually told me that drawing buildings means you have to be an architect, they are obviously the people that actually educated us. Um, and you all have that same experience. So many of us will remember this amazing man, Pancha Geddes, head of school uh, at Wits University when I was at, uh, at, at the school. Uh, the work that he did was absolutely amazing and the way he ran that school was amazing. Uh, I don't know, hands up, anybody know who this guy is? Ivan Cady. He, he lives in America. I, I, he will definitely not know who I am. Uh, I think he drank way too much and played way too much loud music, but he, but he was my first year lecturer. Peter Rich, everybody knows who Peter Rich is. Peter Rich certainly didn't like me as a second year student, but I think we've come to respect each other as, pra as practitioners. Um, Aura Joubert, another amazing lady in my third year. You have to remember that between second year and third year, I had a five year gap. Uh, I won't go into the detail why I took a little detour between second and third year, but anyway, so I was a little bit older than the rest of the guys in third year. Also an amazing lady. Uh, Herbert Prince, fourth year. So when we did architecture so many years ago, your fourth year was a, was a year out and you had to do some sort of scheme. Um, uh, and, he w and he was the, the lecturer involved. I did something about uh, the aesthetics of uh, green buildings, would you believe, in 1987. Um, in sixth year, when we did uh, our submissions for thesis, he was the guy that said, sorry, Bob, you can't do a stadium for your thesis. It's too much fucking engineering, too much about people getting in and out of a building. You'll never, we won't let you do this. If you really want to, one day you will. So as you've heard, I have done a stadium. <laughs> um, Lindsay Bremner. Lindsay Bremner, I, what I really remember about Lindsay is that I pinned some stuff on the wall and she said to the class, don't be fooled by the drawing skills. And I thought, geez, now I must still present after you've told them not to focus on my drawings. What else am I showing the people? Anyway, um, I must tell you that Lindsay is responsible for bringing to us, and I'm gonna embarrass her now, Nisha, bringing Nisha as a student to uh, Burgermann and Partners as a as a third year student, we were looking for students for bursary, and she brought Nisha and another chap who also got a bursary, he's not with us anymore. Nisha came, graduated, left, went to work, went to, went to tutor, came back, she is now an associate director at Burkhardt Partners. So anyone can, 
can uh, grow in the business. Jonah Era had no clue who I was as a six-year student, as a final year student. Uh, he was our mentor. In our July uh, exam, I was standing there with my right hand in, um, in, a, in, a, in a sling because I dislocated my shoulder playing football. He said, Bob, deregister. You're not going to make this. I said, Joe, I don't have money to deregister. I'm going to finish. I finished. I didn't do well. But you know what? 54 doesn't really matter 30 years later. <laughs> This was my university thesis, the, the compromise for not doing a stadium. At the time, I had a girlfriend who was studying um, uh, hotels uh, at the hotel school, catering. So, you know what? Do a hotel school. So, <laughs> so I did a hotel school uh, with my dislocated shoulder. There it is in Bramfontein. It was an old house, and it was an empty stand next door and behind it. And I did a hotel, um, you know, functioning hotel at the top, the little house at the bottom, and a kind of school at the back. So that, that was it. I haven't really done many hotels since. In fact, my colleague Elian here is the hotel specialist in the, in the practice. And that's a model which, believe it or not, I extracted out of my garage about four months ago and brought it to the office because uh, it was uh, going to die a horrible death in the garage. So yeah, so many years later, it still survives. It's still in its box. That's what it is. Uh, I don't need to take you through that. So. Uh, early, early career, uh, you know, I'm just taking you through these steps because we, we, we all have a, ha, have a career and, and one makes strange choices in life. And certainly working at Louis Pence Architects was a strange choice for me. But at the time, it was the only job I could get. I spent four years there um, and I'll only show you one project that I did, which doesn't look like that anymore. This was a renovation of uh, Harry Hagen Court in Plain Street in the center of town. We demolished the back because it was burnt down and we converted it into offices and we built a parking garage at the back. I did not choose the colors. Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Pierce did. I had no choice. I worked for Hink Mantle and Associates, a guy I met as a student, and I, and I don't know if anybody knows him. He has a practice in Emerentia. This is a project I did as a student that I, when I worked for him in my fourth year out was, was a timber house. If you look at the shit on the right hand side, that's what we were meant to do. And, and as a student, I said, no, I don't like that, so let's do something different. So I created the student village. This is a only photograph I could trace. I've never been to this building. If anyone's gone to Kierview or Kierboomstrand or whatever, it's there, it's there somewhere. I have never been there. So look out for it. Apparently, it's still standing. I checked it on Google. You can't get a great image on Google because they don't have street view on this little thing. But anyway, there we go. Um, so, of course, Bergenman and Partners. Now, the reason that I landed up at Bergenman and Partners is that I was at university with Leon Kricher, um, the younger brother of Andre Kricher, who was the then partner of Bergenman Kricher. Um, and, his, and his brother phoned me and said, uh, we need you to join us. I said, Andre, you know, thanks, very flattering, but actually, I'm very happy where I am. I really am not looking to move. Okay, so a couple of days later, he phoned me again. He said, no, 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 you, you're not hearing me properly. You must come and talk to us. I said, yeah, okay, I'll come and talk to you, but I'm really not looking to move. So uh, in true Andre style, those of the, you that knew Andre, uh, he doubled my salary and uh, forced me to buy a car, and uh, I started working there. So the, re so the real reason that I joined the then Bergenman Kriche is I was looking for big jobs. I'm a bit of a megalomaniac at heart. I like the big stuff and coincidentally have managed to do quite a few biggish projects. Um, but the big project that I needed to work on was, okay, so that's us, that's Bochertman and Partners. We, are, um, we have four offices in, in South Africa, we have one in Kenya, and we're 256 people, which, uh, as Leslie said, is a rather large practice on the African continent. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't really matter because there's 17 partners and we all kind of do our own thing and, and sometimes we work together. So that's who we are. We've been going since 1982 um, and hopefully uh, we'll be going for another 80 years. The principle of the practice is not that there is an owner. We don't have any founding partners left in the practice. Andre Kricho left many years ago. Henk Burchertmann left a couple of years later. 
um, and the practice is made up of all these partners. The principle of the practice is bringing young, youngsters in, which why a lady like Nisha can become, come as a student and become soon to be a director, I imagine, but currently an associate director. That, that is the strength of the business, is being fed from the bottom, constantly bringing people up. Um, and the youngsters that are currently students with us will, uh, I think, agree that the opportunities that they get are, are amazing. Anyway, enough of that. That's our offices. These are some of the amazing 256 people that work for us. Uh, you might recognize a few. Sorry, but the image is quite small, but that's who they are. We've been growing, as I said, since 1982, uh, and that is not because we plan to grow. That is just because we keep on growing. We sit down on a Monday and we freak out about a, the amount of work and we say, we need someone else. Okay, so we get someone else. Then we need to get somebody else. And then we keep on getting some more people and then eventually you say, oh shit, we, now we need work for all these people. Um, and, and that doesn't come easy, getting that work. And we know the economy is taking a bit of a nosedive and hopefully we don't go with it, but um, that's quite tough. So now you've got all these people, now you've got to keep them gainfully employed, including yourself. Anyway, so what we do is we do a little bit of everything. Um, specialists in all sorts of fields, uh, from architecture, urban design, interior design, and, and, and space planning. And we do, basically, the only thing that we haven't done is a prison, and that's not through lack of trying. <laughs> uh, we have actually tried to do a prison. On the one, I'm kind of happy that we weren't successful, um, but, we, but we did try. So we, you know, we, we'll have a go at everything. In, in essence, and you'll see a project later where we actually kind of did some amazing engineering work. Um, and, and we've had some serious discussions with contractors on the civil side. You know what? You need us for your bridges. You need us for your tunnel entrances. You need us for your power stations because, my God, they look shit. Um, and you don't have to pay us an architectural fee, but just pay us an hourly rate so that we can help you make the thing look better. Um, I think that, Leslie, from an, from, from an education point of view, something that we should really be working on. This really worries me is that anything that we build, do in the built environment, we talk about built environment professionals, well, hell, surely those things should be looked after as well. I mean, the sad statistic is that 3% of buildings that get put up are done by us. That's not a lot. That's actually quite sad. So we need to make an impression. We need to make much, a much bigger impression. Anyway. So that's why I went to Burgermann and Partners, to do this. Okay, so, you could, so now you can all have a good giggle, but the lady that's now responsible for this project is sitting here in the, in the front row, Helene. So, so I went to go and build a casino. Not because I wanted to build a casino, but because I was interested in the big work, the, na the nature of the big work and what you learn out of doing big projects. So that's why I went there. And at that time, I was 35 years old, I said to myself, this is kind of like the last move I need to make in my career. Nowadays, you only spend three years in a, in a, in a practice and then move. But in those days, I, at 35, I said, I'm going there because that's where I want to stay. That's where I want to, that's where I want to finish. Not because I want to do casinos all my life, but because I want to do the kind of bigger buildings. Um, so I was responsible for all that icing that you see on the building. And in truth, many of the drawings I had to actually do myself. So when we finished that project, I think it was around 2003, um, we were kind of in between things. And uh, my then uh, colleague, Willy Mayer, uh, and myself had kind of had enough of the project. And the client said, we just need someone to kind of hold our hand once a month, do a little bit of maintenance stuff and what have you. And we said, uh, Helian, um, can you take over, please? And she said, yeah, I'm in between a couple of factories and a little office block or two. I've got, I've got some space. I'll take it over. That was in 2003, am I right? She's still working for them, <laughs> almost full time, doing all sorts of other stuff for the, sa the same client. Um, so I went on to go and do my very first office block, which was uh, the head office for MTN. MTN were based in Santon and they were wanting to move out to a site that they owned through then Jonic and uh, uh, at 14th Avenue in Riddaput, and we did an office block. So we won a competition. Henk Borgermann designed a building which was like a big square with a hole in it, 
because he had just done momentum in Centurion, which is a big square with a hole in it. Uh, actually, it's a few squares with holes in it. Um, and we won the competition, and then he said, yeah, Bob, take this. You play with this. So I said, I don't like the square with a big hole in it, so let's do something different. So I did four fingers with three holes in them, but the holes had an outlet to the outside uh, and, a, and a street down the left-hand side. It's kind of a, a basic section, three stories high, three atriums on a single basement, lots of on-grade parking, unfortunately, and that's what it looked like. So uh, that was my first office block, 23,000 square meter, first office block. We won a couple of kind of local awards for it and what have you. Very successful, very disappointing in the sense that they moved with the existing furniture. That's awful, you know. If you ever get a client that wants to move with 20-year-old furniture, tell them to get knotted. Um, anyway, then I did uh, MTN phase two, which was another 23,000 square meters. And fortunately, yeah, we had more traction. Uh, very similar principle, basically four fingers with a central, uh, a central kind of atrium space. The section is very, very similar. The aesthetic is very similar, but functionally it's quite, quite kind of different. And that's what that looks like. So um, the first time I had a chance to kind of interact with, uh, with, with an artist, that, art, that artwork in the middle is by uh, um, Ursula Sigerum, if I pronounce that correctly. I think some, some of you might know her. So that thing's called a pin code. It's made out of millions of little uh, safety pins. Um, anyway. Sitting in that space in the top right-hand corner, I was at a function for, uh, for, for Life College, which is our corporate social investment partner. And uh, they have these champions around the world, and they brought in uh, some people. And um, this lady walked in there, famous singer, whose name escapes me, not so famous, I suppose. Uh, Annie Lennox, thanks, Hillian. Uh, and she sits down next to me, she doesn't know who I am, she says, Fuck, what a nice space. <laughs> so I said, thank you, I'm the architect. Um, but it is, it is quite a nice space for, for a cellular head office. We've been trying ever since then to do phase three. I don't think it's ever going to happen. They can still do another three phases over there, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. Then I did a little shopping center. Not so cool. Then this came up. <laughs> OK, so, so this doesn't happen any time in, uh, this doesn't happen every day. This came into the, into the practice through one of the, our ex-partners who said, uh, some guys from SAFA want to pitch for the World Cup and they have this crappy stadium out in Nazrek. Uh, they need us to do some drawings. So I walked straight into his office. I didn't have any um, seniority in the practice at that time. I said, Vainant, let's be very clear. And this was in English. He's an Afrikaans chap. I said, Vainant, let's be very clear. If there's a football stadium in this practice, there's two people that are going to work on it. It's this guy and a guy called Gavin Tucker, who is an, who is a, he's an ex um, a professional footballer. So we worked on it on risk from about 2004 until we got this project. And I tell you when we got our appointment letter on this project six months after we started building. In the October before they went out to tender, they were still talking to us about buying the design from us. This was the city. The city was a little bit slow in their procurement process. So, uh, and all we said, and I said to my partners at the time, I said, Let's just hang on, just, we just have to be there. They, not, they don't have their game together. It's not gonna happen. We're gonna, they're gonna have to use us. That's what happened. They had to use us, okay? So they went out to tender on our drawings. They hadn't appointed us. We published it. It was probably the smartest move we made, was the moment that we got that thing and there was a design that they had bought, which was this idea of an African calabash. We put it in Style Magazine, would you believe? Anybody remember Style Magazine? Yes, there's a few nods, okay. It was one little image. It wasn't even an image of what we built, but it was the idea. So we owned the idea, and from that moment, the city was stuck. They had to use us. So this was an important kind of step. Anyway, you all know the stadium, I hope. You all watched some football during 2010. I'm glad to hear, Leslie, that you went to three games. I was there as well. I went to all the games at Soccer City. Um, an amazing, amazing experience to be involved in. Um, and amazing to do a building of this nature and this stature for a client that didn't have a clue what they needed. 
we effectively wrote our own brief. The brief was the only criteria that they had committed to in the bid document was a 94,700 seat stadium. Nobody to this day knows where they got that figure from. <laughs> Someone told them it was going to be that big. What they did know is that it had to be the biggest stadium on the African continent. In truth, it's only got 87,000 and a few, you know, they still market it as 94, but it doesn't have those. <laughs> okay. Was the only brief that they gave us, the, uh, sorry, I lie, the other brief they gave us was it had to be FIFA compliant. And it was the one, you talk about white elephants, Leslie, the, the, the one thing that many cities made mistakes on is that they kept, the city managers kept saying, it has to be FIFA compliant. And the FIFA book is one hell of a thing to be compliant to. And we keep saying, the FIFA book's very interesting, but we can't afford this. We, and we don't need this stuff. What we need is a stadium for a legacy point of view. So we argued how high and low not to build everything that FIFA wanted. We said, you want an, a large media contingent? We'll build a tent for you. Because we only need space for 50 guys when you guys bugger off after the World Cup. So we wrote our own brief and, did, and, and essentially just told them what we were doing. As long as we were compliant to the extent that the event could be held. Um, yeah, uh, great fun. The orange has got nothing to do with our <laughs> brand color. I assure you, it has everything to do with sunsets, okay? Um, despite what some uh, naysayers might say. <laughs> the hustle, I put that directly after that. For those of you that don't know, we are still owed 10.5 million rand in fees on this job. Yes, we got a little bit more than the 10.5. But to this day, not the city, the project manager that was our client still owes us money on this one. We still have a legal action against him. So the hustle. Why I wanted to talk about the hustle is that in commercial practice, um, we often talk about this thing of risk work. And the industry talks about this thing of risk work. And I'm going to say fuck. Fuck, we hate it. Um, we hate this idea of risk work. Are there any clients here? <laughs> no. Okay. So, but the point is that the industry suffers from this risk work thing, particularly in South Africa. Um, so, what, so what I started doing, and I have to admit that I started calling it the hustle after I attended Thomas Chapman's talk. Thomas gave us a talk on his hustling in the city. And it made me think of the risk work in a more positive way. So this is not risk work, this is the hustle. Seems like a dance, but often it is a dance. BMW head office, Judith is here somewhere. My pro oh, there, hi Judith. Judith was the project architect on this. How we won this was in competition. We were invited by BMW to, she, uh, they invited five, if I remember correctly, uh, or six uh, practices. They gave us a brief and they told us uh, to come and present. So what did we do? We analyzed the brief and we said, we don't like the brief. We think the brief is wrong. We think the brief is a missed opportunity by BMW to do something much, much better than what the brief tells us. So we went in, I had one or two little sketches and it was the procurement board and the guys from Munich and whoever else. And we said, your brief is wrong. If you agree with your brief, please appoint the people that helped you to do the brief. Um, who had done previous work for, uh, uh, for BMW, the company's called Impundelo. Um, please appoint them because then, because that's what you want. And they did that for you, let them do that. We are here to tell you that here is a list of 50 things of opportunities that you're missing in your brief. If you consider this, you're gonna get, for the same money, a much better product and really do something special to this building. And remember that those of you that know this building, this thing has got architectural merit. merit. Uh, Hans Hallen building from 1986, we had to protect this building. Uh, so what we did is uh, when, they, when, when I finished, the, uh, the, the chief guy from uh, Munich said, wow, uh, uh, an avalanche or a thunderstorm of uh, ideas. And I think the trick there is we took a massive risk in trying to secure the project. We could have gone in with a design, but we told them that they had missed an opportunity. 
So we did that, and uh, we built it. And we saved Hans Hallen's building, and we had the pleasure of walking around with Hans Hallen. Real treat to meet that, the, the old gentleman and to take him through and, to, and for him to kind of proclaim that he was happy with what we had done, that we had given his building a new lease of life um, and, had made it, had, and had made it better. And it's amazing to hear that from the original architect. So the lesson for us out of that was the respect for what other people have done, to not just go in and kick the place over and redo it, because there's no heritage value in this thing. We really, for the, for the same amount of money, we could have demolished this and built something new. Because BMW moved out, they didn't, we didn't renovate this while they were in the building. We moved them out, and that was part of the costs, to move them out, to save the building, and to give them something much better. Um, we won a couple of awards on that. So this is, an, this is another one. So talking about the hustle, you get a phone call on your way into work from a client that says, stop laughing, Roxanne. <laughs> you get a phone call from a client who, who phones you on your way into work and says, I need to go and see a prospective tenant like, in, like now, and I need a design. Okay, so who's it for? No, it's a legal firm. Uh, for which project? For 129 Ravonia, the old village walk. I, I, need a, I need a perspective tomorrow. Shit. Okay, so, yeah, but how big's the building? Yeah, well, it's about 30,000 square meters and it must sit on Ravonia Road. So these are the kinds of briefs that we get, and I'm sure we're not the only ones, but it's ridiculous to get a kind of brief like that. So, so I'm on my way to a facade meeting for another project. I'm sitting in the facade meeting and uh, on my way there, hang on, I'm driving behind a golf, and I, and I check the brake light. Skim, that's a cool shape. <laughs> well, the inspiration has come from somewhere, mustn't it? <laughs> so that's the sketch that I did in, the, in this meeting, photographed with my cell phone, bang off to our rendering artist, Avi. Yeah. Avi, did you do this one? You didn't even do this one. No, Avi didn't even do this one. Someone else did this. So he was too busy, so we sent it to somebody else. So two days later, you have a presentation for a 30,000 square meter building. So that's what we're building now. <laughs> Doesn't look anything like that. But that tenant that we targeted with their sketch is in the building on the right-hand side. Edward Nathan Sonnenberg's legal firm. So that's what we're building now, after many, many iterations of what that thing might be. So uh, on the right-hand side is ENS. On the left-hand side is what is now affectionately called the Jewel, which is for um, uh, MMI Holdings, um, which is a financial services, medical stuff. Okay. So we went through a bit of a process with them as well. So that was the sketch on the right-hand side, which happened after a meeting when they said, no, building's not sexy enough. We need something more contemporary. Uh, we were trying to do something rational for them. So the sketch on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, that's what we're building now. So it's a, it's a, the building on the left-hand side is 35,000 square meters. The building on the right is 17, uh, sorry, 27,000 square meters, and it sits on about 15,000 square meters of, uh, of retail. In the middle of Santon, in the financial district, a kind of real urban scheme. The great pity of this scheme is that we also had, a, sorry, we also had uh, apartments in the scheme. Um, uh, 100, 100 or so apartments, which unfortunately got cancelled by MMI because they wanted to save the future for expansion for themselves. And for us, it's a real pity that we didn't do the, that we aren't doing the apartments. The site is now kind of sterilised. We can't do the apartments. In fact, we can't get there anymore. We need to wait until other stuff be around it uh, gets demolished or those leases run out. Um, but it would have been a truly uh, a mixed-use scheme, instant mixed-use scheme, offices, retail, uh, and residential connected to two existing hotels. So 102 Ravonia, or EY, went through a massive hu hustle as well. This thing was sent out as an RFP by Brawl Properties brokers, and they went to the industry for a new head office for Ernst & Young, then called Ernst & Young. They, bre they rebranded during the process. They got 27 submissions. We did 10 of them. I personally did six. Okay, this is not, so 
it's not just a little scheme. It's a fully worked out scheme with a full professional team all doing costings, rentals, programming, the whole thing, checking out your rights, making sure you can execute on what you promise. They got 27 of these. Talk about a waste of money. What did they do? They chose the site. They didn't choose, any, they didn't choose the developer. They didn't choose us because we were the architects. They didn't choose the design. If that wasn't our design that we submitted. We submitted something else. They chose the site. So why the hell waste so many people's time when all you need to do is say, I want that site? But that's what the industry is doing to us. And Hugh from Paragon will understand that as well because we compete with them. Great competitors, but they're in the same boat. So you know, he knows exactly what we're saying. And, and we both suffer from the same, the, the, the same problem. So anyway, that was kind of intermediate design. That's what we did. Eventually, when they chose the site, they called us into a meeting and said, OK, so here's the site. We want the corner site. It's in Santon. There's this little shitty Avis building. But we didn't control the Avis building, which is the block on the corner site over there. So this is directly opposite the car train station in Santon. Um, and they said, we need to get the corner site. We did a scheme which included the corner site. Our developer client went to the guy who owns the corner site, offered him nearly 100 million bucks. Count those, 100 million bucks. That site's 4,000 square meters, OK? He said, no, thanks. I don't really need the money. <laughs> OK, so we went back to EY and said, sorry, we can't participate. We can't give you what we want. The corner site's gone. A week later, they phoned us and said, come back. We still want the site. Can you do what you did on the bigger, on the bigger site on a smaller site? So it was literally a kind of two minute sketch. Line, hole in the middle, another building, no hole in the middle. <laughs> Connect the two. I, I, I'm playing it down, but that was almost how long it took to do the idea of what they were looking to achieve. Um, obviously, it took a whole bunch of effort to get it done. But essentially, the building on the bottom right is what they wanted, 23,000 square meters, an atrium building. They were in an atrium building, so the atrium was important to them. And, they, and then because of the rights that the developer had on the site, we needed to put in another 15,000 square meters. But we ought to also had to give EY a way to expand organically. The business was growing, and where they were in the current building, they couldn't. So this was go across a bridge and go into another building. And they've already occupied a floor or two of that, uh, of that tower. So that's what it looks like. Uh, it's, a, it's a building that's very undulating. Uh, it has uh, the, the, the fins all the way around the facade. Uh, very cool atrium space. Anyway, so that was that hustle. 10 buildings later on a site. So this is Sandhurst. Now, I call it Sandhurst because that's what it started out being called. Sandhurst is now the discovery site. Um, I'm sure many of you know the discovery site. But this is where we started out many, many, many years ago on risk for no payment. We started working with GrowthPoint. And we kept on working, and they were trying to save the IBM building. And then they tried to link into the IBM building and create a separate entrance, and the, building, the new building's on the left-hand side. This is all completely speculative stuff. We have no tenant. We have no end user. We just, we're working. And then we change it some more. So this was one of the competing schemes that I submitted for EY. So whilst you're doing the one, you do, I was doing five others. The same thing. Why I'm taking you through this, this, this journey of the hustle is it's important to understand what goes into getting to what you eventually build, if you're lucky enough to eventually build it. Um, and so there is, whether you like these buildings or not, I don't really care. Um, but what, 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 what is important is that there's an, an, an immense amount of creative energy and effort that goes into these things. Um, and statistically, what we as a practice have eventually found out, and maybe Ilian's going to kick me now, is that 50% of the time that we put on our timesheets, we cannot allocate to a project. Now, Hugh can maybe take that back to his practice and say, 
What is our statistics? I don't know. But I mean, there's a massive amount of creative energy that gets tossed into the bin because it never happens. These things will never see the light of day. So thank you for the opportunity to share this with some of you. <laughs> so then I, I did this building on the same site. Again, for IBM, IBM's going to move, IBM's going to move. You know that you can't get a cup of coffee when you go visit IBM? The, your guest has to buy that out of his pocket because they employ 400,000 people across the world. 400,000 people have one cup of coffee. You know how much that costs? So they just said, we don't do coffee. Anyway, we never did a building for them either. Um, <laughs> they, they moved into someone else's building on a competition that we lost. Um, so we did this building. And we said, uh, uh, oh, this is fantastic. There are old IBM buildings on the right-hand side. This is the view from Ravonia Road. This building almost got me fired because I didn't copy a building that I was apparently told to copy. You have to listen now carefully. I didn't copy a building because I didn't apparently co copy a building I was told to copy that I apparently had visited in uh, Melbourne, which I hadn't visited. I got fired because I didn't copy that building because I did this. Okay, okay. I'd never got fired, fortunately. That was close. So then we did some more, because now we, now we bid for everything, don't you? That's what we all did. Hughes Practice eventually did this, not on the site, but for Bowman's, they built a head office for Bowman's. But everybody, the whole market went after this thing as well, including us. Okay, so then the big discovery came up. So we had an urban designer, Pierre Swanepoel, that was on our team that had got brought on after the fact. And uh, uh, one of his urban design criteria was there must be a hotel. That thing on the right-hand side, not the, American em not the American embassy, that tall, thin thing, it's a hotel. Needed to have a hotel. We were going to do a deal with a hotel. Then we needed to phase this. We did all of this. So this is what we submitted for the discovery deal. So that's the view from Ravonia Road and Santon Drive. Uh, this was 80,000. We had to phase it because of our site boundaries and things like that. So this was, um, uh, I'm trying to work that out now, 40, 45,000, 35,000 in phases. And uh, we needed to get a street through the middle of it, which is what, what it had, and it needed to connect to another 200,000 square meters of urban design framework that Pierre had done. So that never happened. Uh, but it got us across the road or got us across the finishing line. Well, I think we were, it was ourselves against, uh, against Paragon and their, and their client. So this was a little sketchy thing. And then we changed it completely. But like completely. We kicked the hotel out and my colleague Alistair is sitting there behind Leslie and he will remember a fateful morning where he didn't work or where he didn't sleep all night and neither did Avi who was doing a render all night. And we arrived and we presented a scheme and I said, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to do something different. And we started doing this. And we presented this scheme.
Okay, so that was our presentation. Um, I'm presenting to the board of uh, Discovery, and 20 minutes into the presentation, Adrian Gore stops me. Now, he's seen the previous building. 20 minutes into this presentation, he says, whoa, 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 stop, stop. He says, did you redesign the building? I said, yeah, you didn't like the hotel, so we had to redesign the building. He says, why don't you just leave the hotel off? He said, no, because it doesn't work, so you have to redesign the building. Oh, okay, got it. So uh, that's what it is, um, and that's what it's currently looking like. And as it turned out, we landed up working with Paragon, who did the interiors with us on this. Uh, so that, there we go. Uh, we didn't do the third phase, which is the little piece on the left-hand side over there. Um, but we did phase two, so we're even doing phase two, which is a little piece on the right-hand side. The little piece on the right-hand side is only 21,000 square meters. Um, that sounds very flippant, but to give you a sense of scale of here, this is 110,000 square meters of GLA for one tenant on top of 200,000 square meters of basement. It's a monster. Um, very cool atrium space. That atrium is 2,800 square meters of roof, of glass roof in an, in an office block. Um, the roof garden, just spoke to my colleagues, the roof garden is coming on really, really amazingly, apparently. Um, it's a four-year journey. We spent a year going down into the ground to spend a year to come back up to ground level and another two years to finish the top structure. So that's four years of building journey, never mind the journey of all the stuff that went beforehand. So sometimes the hustle pays off. Uh, just some more uh, internal... Next hustle. This is also in Santon. Maybe it's Santon and hustling. I don't know. Um, so this was a design done for by a colleague of mine, uh, Gerard Boer, who uh, was working for a client who doesn't own the site anymore, but we're still busy on the site. This was to try and put 210,000 square meters of lettable area on a tiny little 21,000 square meter site. So you can imagine that everything needs to be 40 stories tall. So as you know, that didn't happen. And we started working for another client who bought the site and paid too much for it. And also wanted to do 200,000. And we told him max 100,000 makes any sense whatsoever. So this is just early stuff. Then we got a, suddenly got a JV partner forced on us who started making us do this and this. And we did this with him. Does this look familiar? <laughs> yeah. OK. Enough said. Um, and, then, uh, and then, you know, oh, shit, nothing's happening. Let's try and do something a little bit more rational for Edward Nathan Sonnenbergs. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. So, and then for Discovery on another site, so let's do, yeah, let's put the twisty back in and let's shoehorn it into a design and try and do something else. And then the JV partner and his development manager left. 
and then we started working for someone else. So then we did this scheme, also for discovery, um, which was the same brief as the one that we responded to earlier. And yeah, we had a massive parking problem. We couldn't sort all this. You know that Discovery asked for six bays per 100 square meters on 80,000 square meters, which is now six bays per 100 on 110,000 square meters. But fortunately, we're not giving them six. We're giving them less because it's ridiculous. Um, so that's what, we, that's what we did because we didn't have too many choices. We had to do this tower scheme, which was crazy because their brief said, don't give us a tower scheme. But the developer said, tower scheme. Okay, tower scheme. We didn't win, obviously. This got chucked out at like the first round. Anyway, and it, and it had to be phased. Imagine phasing 20-story towers on top, of a, uh, on top of a structure. We worked the entire thing out. We converted parking garages to office space. We converted everything. We, this was seriously tricky. Okay, so we weren't successful. Then we did this. These are our proposals for a Marriott hotel on the same site. Um, I'm kind of flipping through this, but this is where we keep hustling. And, and it's kind of soul-destroying in many ways to do all this work for it not to happen. So that was a Marriott Hotel, 40 stories high. And then it became a Ritz-Carlton Hotel. Then we flew to Abu Dhabi. That was cool. Um, paid for. Ate very nice food. Um, did some work, presented some stuff, they loved it, um, but it never happened. We thought we had the in because their development director was a South African boyki. <laughs> Fat load of good that did us. Okay, and then uh, Bank of China, which everybody did, and Worksman's, which everybody did, um, and, then, and then Worksman's brought on their interior designer who told us what to do. So we did that. That's like depressing, right? Yeah. Anyway, but that's the reality. So it had to be a glass box on a, on a themed base. We tried to do different. Now we had to do this. So sometimes you have to do what you don't really want to do. So it's nearly finished two months later. And then we did proposals for the advocates chambers, which never happened on the same site, because now that site that wanted 210,000 square meters can now only realistically take 100,000 square meters. So we're only, only doing 21 for worksmen's, which means we now need to fill the other 80. And then we responded like the rest of the market to Deloitte's, which was on the same site. Uh, we had great fun, we had two weeks, we put 16 people on this, and we didn't, what we think was an amazing scheme given the conditions of the site, um, and they didn't go for it. But we are building worksmen's, which here are some of the details. That's what we tried to do for them instead of the themed stonework. But they didn't want that, so we're doing this. And there it is, it's under construction. We're kind of two months away from, uh, from building. Um, very simple floor plates, lots of offices. Um, central core, fire escape on the one end, and that, that, that circular thing is the fire escape. That big horrible wall in the middle is where the next building will eventually come one day when we build it. But what we also do is we also do this. This is a different kind of hustle. Um, and uh, this is a little scheme which is almost like a pro bono thing, but not really. Um, but we haven't been paid, but that doesn't really matter. Um, so those of you that know who Wangari Matai is, she's a Nobel uh, Prize winner uh, for the work that she did trying to save uh, the forests um, in, uh, in Kenya. And this is a legacy to her. This is an initiative by her da daughter that runs the Wangari Matai Foundation. And this is a little scheme to represent uh, and to perpetuate the, her life's work, which is about saving the forests and about creating work opportunities. So very simply, circular building, which talks about the tree, it's internalized. Um, you cross a pond of water and you get to a central portion and it's essentially a kind of education facility. Um, and we won World Architecture Festival Future Culture Building of the Year last year for that little scheme. 
So sometimes you do stuff that maybe one day will get built, um, but amazing to do this little building. Uh, hopefully we get to build it one day. So why do we do this? Kind of coming near the end, I think. Why do we work 14 hours a day? Why don't we get enough sleep? Why do we fight with our partners? That's our business partners and our life partners. Why do we get told what to do by our clients? Why do we spend, this is a true story, happened last week. This is a decision that needs to be made by a tenant on whether we want a rubber stopper or a stainless steel one with a little bit of rubber on their offices. There's 200 offices. The cost difference between the one and the other, this one on the right costs 23 rand, the other one on the left costs 53 rand. There's 250 of these stupid things. So the cost differential is 6,150 rand. Cost differential on a 1.4 billion rand project. We spent hours and hours and hours debating which one is better. I actually don't care. <laughs> so this is why. So that you can get a phone call and you can fly to Paris and do a three-day workshop and do this. So we get invited by Gronica LTA and Bouyeg. Bouyeg are one of the world's biggest contracting firms. Myself and my ex-partner, who's also my brother-in-law, which I haven't seen for recently, but anyway, separate story. Um, so we fly over, we go to their head office, they throw us in a boardroom, and they say, we've had these French bridge architects doing this scheme for us in Mauritius. They've been working on this for months and months, six months, to be exact. We still don't know what the bridge looks like. Can you help us? Yeah, oh, sure, why the hell not? So we raid the secretary's uh, stationery store because they've got nothing, it's an engineering firm. We take all her print, all her markers, all her paper, and we come up with a scheme. We talk to little Jean-Pierre, little French guy, little round glasses. Jean, he can hardly speak English, but my French is a bit shit as well. So Jean, uh, what about this little, ah, oh, and he runs upstairs, and half an hour later he comes back and he says, what about, what about this? And then I sketch some more, and I say, what about this? And he runs up, and he comes back, and he says, what about this? This happened for three days. Anyway, so we got paid for that. We submitted this, and we won. This is a bridge across the port of Port Louis. We won this. But the bloody thing got cancelled by, by, the, by the government. But this was so cool to do. This is so diff This is not you know, what we do as bread and butter stuff. This is not our day, daily work. But this is such cool stuff to do, and I think it's an amazing bridge. I don't know what you think, but this is really cool. That's why we work those stupid hours. And so that we can do this and affect people's lives. And these oaks had such a ball. Such a ball. That's why we do this. So this is, the, this is the first time I'm showing this. In fact, the client is only going to see this tomorrow. So keep it to yourselves. No pictures, please. So we had a brand relaunch in February, and we met this unbelievable woman called Lee Den Hunt. She's insane. This chick climbed Mount Everest. She had never been on a mountain in her life. She went all the way up Mount Everest. Why? because she wanted to raise money to build a community center for those kids. So she did that, flag and everything on the top of Mount Everest. She came to give us a motivational talk when we did our brand relaunch, which was in February. Amazing speaker, amazing woman. When we met her and we had a discussion with her about, about what, why she does this insane stuff, she said, it's for these kids. My next job is I want to build an early learning center and a little clinic. So Nisha, who was with me, we sat there and we said, we'll do that for you with pleasure. Fantastic. So that's what that is. It's a little early learning center, 10 little classrooms, um, and a little clinic on the left-hand side. The gray box on the top is this shed that she built, 500 square meters for a million bucks that she built out of her own money. She bought the land out of her own money. So. If you want to donate, please call us.
there's some uh, early renders of it. Very simple, little brick structures, little double garages, all in a different shape. They all teach the kids something about shape and color and texture um, and, uh, and, a little, and a little shed. Remember, we have to build this out of no one's back pocket. It has to, it literally, this comes out of donations and, and goodwill. So try and love what you do. That's our hashtag, building a better tomorrow. I think that's meant to be designing a better tomorrow. But anyway. <laughs> and, and now for the real reason. So this I found on the internet. Okay, so that's why you do it, to have a laugh. <laughs> so my last question to you, and you don't have to answer it. Are you an architect, or is it what you do? Thank you.